Awesome. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks uh, again for joining us for another NL seminar. Today, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Tom McCoy. Tom is a PhD student in the John Hopkins Cognitive Science Department advised by Tal Lindzen and Paul Smolensky. He studies the linguistic abilities of neural networks, focusing on inductive biases, as well as compositional structure, uh, trying to answer how can neural networks use their continuous vector representation to encode phrases and sentences. So thanks, uh, thanks Tom for accepting our invitation and joining us today. And everybody, please join me in welcoming Tom and enjoying his talk. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for having me here. I'm really excited to be uh, joining you all today. Uh, so the work I'll be talking about is a collaboration with Aaron Grant, Paul Swansky, Tom Griffiths, and Tom Linson. Uh, and it's about universal linguistic inductive biases via meta-learning. Um, and let me also say uh, throughout this, I'll be trying to stop every so often for questions, but you should also feel free to interrupt me if you have any clarification questions or anything. Um, and there should be probably 15 or 20 minutes at the end for any longer questions or Q&A you wanted to have. Uh, okay, so learning a language, whether it's being done by a human or by a model, depends on two factors. Uh, it obviously depends on data in that language. You can't learn a language from nothing. But less obviously, it also depends on the learner's inductive biases, which are the factors that affect how the learner will generalize beyond the data. So here's an example of inductive biases in action. We have two learners here who have been told that the blue square is an example of a DAX and the green triangle is an example of a BLIC. And now they have to tell us whether this blue triangle is a DAX or a BLIC. Well, the learner on the left has an inductive bias for generalizations based on shape. So this learner would reason that DAX means square and BLIC means triangle, and therefore the new shape is a BLIC. While the learner on the right has an inductive bias for generalizations based on color. So this learner would reason that DAX means blue object and BLIC means green object, and therefore the new shape is a DAX. Crucially, even though these two learners saw the exact same training data, they've made different generalizations because they have different inductive biases. So why should we care about inductive biases in NLP? Well, two of the most prominent weaknesses of current models relate very closely to inductive biases. The weaknesses I have in mind are first, that these models require humongous training sets, far more data than humans require uh, to learn the same phenomena. And second, these models tend to generalize poorly to novel types of examples. That is, they perform very well on examples that are similar to ones they've seen before, but any kind of outer distribution generalization is really going to dramatically lower performance for any neural model, basically. Um, and both of these weaknesses could be addressed by giving our models better inductive biases, because inductive biases are the factors that guide how models learn and how they generalize. Uh, the question that we focus on in this talk is, how can we give the needed biases to our models? So what we're going to try to do here is to introduce a framework for giving targeted linguistic inductive biases to a neural network. So here's an outline of how this framework works. There are four steps to it, um, which I'll walk through in more detail soon. The first step is to define the inductive biases that you wish to give to your model. Then the second step is to translate those biases into a space of languages which encode these biases in some way. The next step, and probably the crucial one, is to have a model meta-learn from languages drawn from this space of languages. I'll get into meta-learning in more detail soon, but briefly, the way it works is that you uh, expose your model to a whole bunch of related tasks, where in our case, each task is a language. And from seeing all of these different languages, the model picks up on commonalities um, between the languages and also the ways in which languages can differ from each other. And from observing all these properties, the model gains the ability to learn any given language from a small number of examples. And our hope is that um, by giving the model the ability to learn from a small number of examples, this also has the effect of giving our intended inductive biases to the model. Uh, but we cannot be certain that it has that effect. So the final step of our framework is to analyze the model to see if meta-learning indeed had that effect that we wanted it to have. So in this presentation, I'll be walking through this framework using a case study from linguistics based on syllable structure, where we find that meta-learning successfully imparts all of the target inductive biases that we were trying to impart. Okay, so in the talk, I'll first uh, touch on some related work, then I'll walk through those four steps of our framework for this one case study I mentioned, 
Um, then we'll have some discussion and Q&A. So first, re the related work. Uh, there's been a lot of really interesting and exciting work happening in meta-learning recently in NLP, so I certainly uh, can't get into all of it, but just to touch on the main types of work people have been doing. Uh, one area where people have used meta-learning a lot is for low resource languages. The idea is that you can have your model meta-learn from high resource languages, um, which will hopefully give the model some few shot learning capabilities, the ability to learn from few examples, and that these capabilities will then really help for low resource languages, the languages where we don't have a lot of data. So this is, has been applied to several different types of tasks, machine translation, language modeling, uh, NLU tasks, morphological inflection, and more. Um, now, another thing that's subtly different is to use meta-learning over related tasks or subparts of tasks. So rather than meta-learning, so the thing I mentioned earlier was meta-learning where each episode during the meta-learning process is a different language. So you're trying to learn how to generalize across languages. Uh, in this type of approach, each individual task that you meta-learn over is within the same language, but each task targets a different uh, linguistic capability or a subpart of the broader task you care about. So the idea is here that it's supposed to teach you something about um, how to build up your understanding of this task. Our focus here is a bit different, I think, from these other types of works, which is um, here we start with some inductive bias that we want to give to the model. And our goal is to give that inductive bias or that set of inductive biases to our model. So um, I view this as something that's more targeted than um, simply trying to seek few shot learning. And I think there is one prior work that is especially close to this goal, which is uh, Brendan Lake has this really nice work on meta sequence to sequence learning where um, here the goal is to improve how models compositionally generalize. Um, so like I said, I really love this work, but I think the approach he takes in this work is um, very specific and it's hard to see how you could generalize it beyond the specific task and data set he's working on. And here we're trying to, to propose something that's a bit more general. Okay, so what is it that we are doing? Well, I mentioned earlier these two weaknesses of current models that are really what motivate us, um, namely the fact that they require massive training sets, and they generalize poorly to novel types of out-of-distribution examples. So these are the things I use to motivate the need for um, giving our models better inductive biases. But if we want to do this, there are really two distinct problems that need to be solved, at least under the way we're viewing it. First, you need to figure out which inductive biases do we need to give our models. And then once you know which biases you want to give the models, you also have to figure out how you can actually give them to the models. And in this work, our focus is on that second problem. We are proposing a technique for, given that there are some particular biases you want to give the models, how can you do that? Um, and I will mention in passing that solving two can also then help you with one, because once you know how to give biases to a model, you can then try out a whole bunch of candidate biases and see which ones help the most to see which ones really are needed. But here we're really just focusing on two. Um, so as I mentioned before, our framework has these four different steps, which I'll now walk through with one specific example. The first step is to define the inductive biases that you wish to give to your model. That is, what is the target learning behavior that you want to impart to the model? And for this, um, we wanted a case study that is, on the one hand, simple enough for us to understand it well, because our goal here is to introduce something new, and we want to really be sure that this new thing is doing the thing we want it to do. And for that, we need something, something simple enough um, for us to know what we want and to see if the method is actually doing that. But on the other hand, we also want it to be complex enough to be interesting and non-trivial. So for this purpose, the phenomenon we chose is syllable structure typology from linguistics. Um, so here's the specific way we're looking at this phenomenon. Um, we'll be adopting the analysis of syllable structure as it's handled in optimality theory, which is a very popular framework in linguistics. Um, for this presentation, you don't need to know anything about optimality theory beyond what I'll say in these slides. So under this framework, we assume that every word has some underlying form, such as KTA, and a surface form, that is the form you actually pronounce, such as kata. I'm using periods here in the surface form to denote boundaries between syllables. Or to give another real example from English, uh, if you want to form the opposite of the word possible, you do that by taking the prefix in and putting it at the start. And we know that the prefix is in by looking at other examples like inadequate or um, independent, 
But in the case of possible, when we add in at the front of it, we don't actually say in possible, we say impossible. So here the underlying form is impossible, but that gets transformed to the surface form impossible. Okay, but going back to this KTA example, uh, the other part of optimality theory is that languages can differ from each other in how that underlying form gets mapped to the surface form. So in one language, KTA might get turned into kata by inserting this vowel A, whereas in another language, it might get turned into ka by deleting the consonant T. And the pattern that, that is which mapping a given language uses is governed using four constraints. So here I'll illustrate these four constraints um, with some examples where in each example, what we have is an input form, BIP, and then uh, three distinct possible output forms that you could have given this input where the possible output forms are B, BIPA, and BIP. The first constraint that governs this mapping is called onset which states that every syllable should start with a consonant. This is called onset because in linguistics, uh, the onset is the term for a consonant at the start of a syllable. So here, all three of the possible output forms satisfy this constraint because in all three of them, all of the syllables start with a consonant. The second constraint is called no coda, which says that no syllable should end with a consonant. The name for this one comes from the fact that the coda in phonology is a consonant at the end of a syllable. And here, the first two output examples satisfy this constraint, but the third one violates the constraint because the output form here does end with a consonant, the consonant P. The next constraint um, is more intuitive or obvious. It's called no insertion, which says that nothing should be inserted into the input. This is violated by the middle example because the letter A has been inserted to it, but the other two both satisfy it. And then the final constraint is called no deletion, which says that nothing should be deleted from the input. And this one is violated by the first example because the P has been deleted, but the other two are fine. And I'll mention in passing that these four constraints are motivated by uh, properties that hold across the real languages in the world. For instance, across languages, languages tend to really prefer syllables that start with a consonant, but do not end with a consonant. So that's where these constraints came from. Um, they're not just arbitrary. Now, one of the key parts of this is that sometimes these constraints conflict with each other. That is, if you look at these examples, it's impossible. We do not have any options that um, are good from the perspective of all the constraints. So, for example, if we look just at no coda, um, we see that the first two are good from the perspective of no coda, but the third one violates it. Um, so, this might make us think that the third one would be the worst one. But then, if we instead look at the um, other two constraints, now no coda, um, or now the third one is the only one that doesn't violate either of these constraints, whereas the other two output possibilities violate at least one of them. So how do we resolve these sorts of conflicts between constraints? The way that we do it is by ranking these four constraints. That is, we assign a prioritization to them. For instance, if we rank the constraints in the order they're shown here, where we say that onset is the most important one, then no coda is second most important, then no insertion, then no deletion. Under that ranking, the first one, BIP goes to BIP, would be the one that wins because the only constraint that it violates is the least important one, no deletion. But if we reorder these constraints um, using some very sophisticated PowerPoint animation technology, um, you can see that now the one that wins is the one at the bottom because now it is the one with the least serious violation. Um, so these differences in rankings explain why languages differ from each other in terms of the input-output mappings that we observe. Okay, so this is the optimality theory framing that we're adopting, and our goal will be to give our models a set of inductive biases that encode knowledge of this framework. That is, we want it to encode knowledge of which languages are possible and impossible under this framework. Um, so let me pause here. Does anyone have any questions about this optimality theory framing, since I know it can be a lot to take in? Cool, then I'll uh, move on. Um, so that was the first step of our framework, was to define the inductive biases or the priors that we want to give to our model. And now the second step is to translate those biases into a space of languages. And in this case, the step is relatively straightforward where in order to create a single language, we first just define the set of consonants that can appear in that language, um, as well as the set of vowels that can appear in that language. 
Now also recall that in this optimality theory framing, sometimes you need to insert a sound um, when you map the input to the output. So we also need to choose uh, when, so for situations where we need to introduce a consonant, which consonant do we insert? And for situations where we need to insert a vowel, which vowel do we insert? And then the final parameter governing an individual language here is a, and probably the most important one, is a constraint ranking. Um, how do we prioritize these four constraints that govern the input output mapping? Okay, so choosing values for these five parameters allow us to define one single uh, synthetic constructed language that we'll create, and then we simply need to um, generate a whole a very large number of these synthetic constructed languages. Now we move to the um, really crucial step here, which is to, uh, now that we've constructed all these synthetic languages, we have a model meta-learn from languages drawn from that space of languages. Uh, so the model that we'll be using for this purpose is just a standard sequence to sequence LSTM uh, without attention, where the input to the seek to seek model is the underlying form of a word presented a uh, one character at a time, such as B I P. And then the output is the um, surface form uh, of this word, again, presented one character at a time, in this case, period, B I period, end of sequence token. And before I describe how meta learning works, I'm going to start by describing um, something you're probably already familiar with, which is how standard learning works, because I think it's easier to understand meta learning um, if we first frame standard learning in a specific way. So our model, just like any neural network, is governed by a very large number of numerical parameters. Um, and we can view the set of parameters as being a point in some um, multi-dimensional space where the number of dimensions is equal to the number of parameters we have. Now, in reality, our model has millions of parameters, so that would require me to draw a million dimensional space, which isn't really practical. So let's just pretend it as two parameters so I can draw it as this two dimensional space. Uh, so our model will be represented at some point in this space. And there's some specific language that we want the model to learn. So there's some region of parameter values in this space, which would allow our model to perform well on this language. The problem is that we don't know where this region is. So the usual way to uh, find this region is to first just initialize our model's parameters at some randomly selected point, and then we train it on examples drawn from that language, where what you do is you show the model a single example or maybe a batch of examples, um, and then see how the model does on that example, compute its error on that example, and then figure out how you could adjust the model's weights such that if it saw the same example again, it would do a little bit better on this example. That is, it would have a smaller error on this example. Then we showed another example, um, compute the error, figure out how to adjust the weights so that the model would do better on this example. And we keep doing this with a whole bunch of examples from the language until eventually the model's parameters end up at a point where it can now handle this language really well. Okay, so this was standard learning with standard gradient descent. Now we move to meta-learning, where in standard learning, the goal was to have the model learn one particular language. Whereas in meta-learning, the goal will be to give our model the ability to learn any language in some space of languages. For this reason, meta-learning is also sometimes known as learning to learn. The specific type of meta-learning that we will be using is called MAML, a short for model agnostic meta-learning from Finn et al. Um, so what MAML does is it allows your model to learn a parameter initialization that supports rapid learning. So here's an illustration of how MAML works. Just like before, we will visualize our model as um, some point in this 2D parameter space. But now instead of having just one language that we're focusing on, there's a whole space of possible languages, each one of which has some region of parameter values that would allow you to do well on this language. And just like before, we initialize our model at some randomly selected point. And now here's how meta-learning works. We randomly sample some language from our space of languages and train our model on a few examples from this language. So this step is done just with the standard learning I already showed you. But now at the end of this um, brief episode of training on just a few examples, we evaluate the model on the test set for this language, language one, and then figure out how could we adjust this model's initialization such that if we train the model again on the same examples from language one, it would now do a little bit better on language one's test set. That is, we're going back to the initialization. We're not looking at the trained weights, we're looking at the weights before training and figure out how we can tweak this initialization. 
And then we do that to give ourselves a new initialization. Then we sample a new language, language two, and once again, train the model on a small number of examples from language two, then figure out how the initialization could be adjusted so that if the model were trained on language two, again, it would now do a little bit better on the test set for language two than it did this first time. And after doing this many times with a whole bunch of languages sampled from this space of languages, ideally the model's initialization will end up at some position like this one. Um, and the reason that this position is desirable is that it enables the model to easily learn any language from our space of possible languages. So a key thing to point out here is that MAML is focused on the model's initialization. That is, whatever inductive biases are imparted via MAML, they have to be encoded in the model's parameter initialization. There are other approaches to meta-learning, which instead focus on learning a model architecture, um, but we use MAML because it is, I think, more mainstream and easier to get to work than the architecture-based approaches. Um, so in our experiments, we will be comparing a model that was initialized with MAML to a randomly initialized model. Uh, so these two models are identical to each other in their architecture. They only differ in their parameter initialization. Okay, so any questions about how MAML works? Uh, so just quickly, uh, from, from your uh, explanation, it seems that, assuming that you're training to convergence, that the initialization point that is best for language one is the end point from training for language one. Is it not? Um, that is right, yes. Um, but the problem is that if you just went to that point, then you might um, sort of overfit to language one. Um, True. Just, I'm, I'm yeah. just trying to understand the um, the uh, from from your conception what what you what you mean about adjusting for the best initialization point. Since it seems if you are just constrained to choose this optimization one language at a time, that um, you know absent some uh, regularization or smooth uh, adjustment, you're basically always going to want to go somewhere towards whatever your endpoint was per language. Right. Um. Yeah, so I think that's right. It's possible that the parameter space is nonlinear in some weird way where you don't actually, you know, so maybe the path of learning takes you in some weird roundabout way where you actually would not want the initialization to move in that direction because it would take you into some weird in between space. Um, but yeah, I will say there is this other method called reptile, which was named sort of as an homage to mammal, where they do exactly that thing where so mammal takes these sort of second order gradients um where you are um that's the thing where you yeah are differentiating your test set error with respect to that initialization but in reptile you don't do any of that it's much more straightforward just um exactly moving the initialization in the direction of those final trained weights just multiplied by some epsilon to make it a smaller step size and reptile turns out to work um very well if not quite as well as mammal um, still very close to it. So I think that intuition is right based on the um, success of Reptile. I have a, a sort of related question. Um, I noticed in your, in your, like, your visualization of how MAML works, all of the languages were fairly clustered in the parameter space so that you were effectively like moving the initialization in the same direction. Um, how does mammal how does mammal kind of work when if they're all really spread out in the parameter space right that's a great question so i think there are i guess two ways to answer it the first is that um really what mammal depends on or what having an inductive bias depends on is that there is some regularity in the space of possible tasks so this i think is something like the no free lunch theorem i guess where um you know it's possible that there would be some or, or like an inductive bias is only useful if there is some commonality across your tasks that you can exploit um the other way to answer that question i think is that really this illustration was kind of simplifying things where i pretended that for each language there's only this single um you know nicely oval region in parameter space that corresponds to the language but really given the way neural networks work we know that there are a million local optima that are all roughly equally good. So probably for each language, there's actually some weird squiggly discontinuous thing spread all throughout the parameter space that would be roughly equally good. Um, so even though 
you know, there will not, there might not actually be this kind of cluster room where all the languages are in basically the same space. It still is plausible that there will be some point in the space which is close to part of the big squiggly thing for every language that you have, um, because each language has kind of all these weird parts reaching out from it. Um, there might well be formal analysis into that, which I'm not familiar with. I know that's a very hand wavy explanation, but that's the intuition I have about it. It was a helpful intuition. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. I have a quick question about the, the mapping between your optimality theoretic discussion and this discussion about NAML. So yes. in this discussion, it seems like you're trying to, to get an inductive bias that's common to all the languages. But in OT, the only thing that's common to all the languages is an unranked constraint set. Is that what you're trying to learn? An inductive bias for what the constraints are? Um, yes, yeah, so we have a, so that's one of them. We have sort of a list of specific things we're trying to give. Um, and the analysis I'll get to in a minute gets at two of those in, in our paper, we have a few more, but yeah. So I can briefly say um, it's basically the set of constraints. Um, and then there's also the, um, procedure of ranking the constraints, I guess, kind of the mechanisms of what you do with the constraints. That's another thing that's universal. Um, and then there are certain um, properties of, so I think those are the two basic things and you can break these down into some things that kind of derive from those two basic things. Like um, given that this is the set of constraints, we wanna be biased for X constraint over Y constraint where the Y constraint is one that's not in this set. Um, or there are, um, the, the last type of thing, I guess, is um, types of generalization that are predicted by the set of constraints where if you know that your language um, has one property, then you automatically know that your language has another property because of the way that the set of constraints constrains your hypothesis space. So I'll give an example of that. And that um, is another inductive bias we want to give the models. And you could view that as really just being part of the larger bias of that's described just by the set of constraints we have and the way of ranking them. Um, but at least in our write-up of it, we sort of break these down and view them um, separately. Cool, um, any other questions? These are all great uh, questions. Okay, great, so I'll um, move on then. Yeah, yeah, so now we have these two models. We have a model whose initialization was determined by MAML and then another control model that was just randomly initialized. Um, and the way that MAML is usually presented is that it's meant to give models a few shot learning abilities, the ability to learn from a small number of examples. Um, whereas here, what we are trying to do is give our models some specific inductive biases. And it seems plausible that um, if we've constructed our space of languages properly, it seems plausible that few shot learning uh, should indicate that it has the correct inductive biases, but we can't be certain of that. So this final analysis step will be to check if that is indeed the case. Uh, but before we get into the, that actual analysis, I will just demonstrate the few shot learning abilities because I think it is kind of fun to see. So I'll be showing that with some screenshots from a demo we put online um, where uh, the demo just has the weights of our model uploaded and you can train it on specific languages. So here's a screenshot of what the demo looks like. Um, in this specific example, uh, here we're trying to train our models on this single specific language, um, where in this language, the pattern that governs the language is regardless of what the input is, um, every syllable in the output must be of the form consonant vowel. So in some cases, the input already satisfies that restriction and you, you don't need to do anything beyond adding the periods that we use for um, syllable boundaries. But in other cases, where the input does not already satisfy that restriction, you have to add something to make it satisfy the restriction. So sometimes we insert the consonant D as in this circled example, other times we insert the vowel E and other times you have to do some of both. And here are, uh, yeah, go ahead. Is each of those examples supposed to be from a different language? Oh no, they're each from the same language. Okay, so the the um, this pattern to be learned is the pattern of of this one language. That's right. Say, right, and there's not like some meta pattern. You don't set things up so that you have some like grand meta pattern to learn. Uh, that's correct. I, I mean, I guess you could say that meta learning was learning the grand meta pattern. Um, but now with oh. any language, there's just this one pattern. Right. 
you know, the grand meta pattern is that there are the four constraints, right? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So these are just examples drawn from one language. And before we train our models on this specific language, these are the predictions that they make using just their initial weights. Um, and so you can see that in the model initialized with MAML, uh, the meta initialized model, it's already getting one of the examples correct. So I'm using uh, the words are in green if they're predicted correctly, red if they're predicted incorrectly. Um, yeah, and it's it sort of makes sense that the MAML model is getting this example right, because in the specific optimality theory framing we're using, it happens to be the case that no matter what language you're in, an input of the form constant and vowel is guaranteed to stay the same um, in the output. That is, there's no way to improve upon it. So no matter what the language is, the input of BE is guaranteed to have this output. So it makes a lot of sense that MAML has picked up on that universal pattern, but it's still good to see that it has picked up on that. But for the rest of the examples, um, MAML's getting them wrong, and of course the randomly initialized model's getting them wrong. So we will need to train these models on some examples in this language to get them to actually learn this specific language. Are you going to say something about the nature of the model? Oh, um, so it's the seek to seek LSTM. Um, or, oh yeah, so it's the model I mentioned like before um, I walked through how meta learning works. So it's just a seek to seek LSTM without attention, um, nothing too fancy. Thanks. Yeah. Um, oh, I guess one thing to mention about it is that um, it's probably larger than you would expect the model to need to be for a synthetic task of this case. So I think it has a hidden size of 128. Um, and we haven't really investigated whether the hidden size needs to be that big, but it might well be the case that, you know, MAML requires you to have a larger hidden state than you would think because it needs to encode not just the information about this language, but also sort of the space of possibilities um, governing the space of languages for whatever that's worth. Um, okay, so we, uh, first show these models, this one example from this language, and um, their predictions have changed a bit, but they're still mostly getting them wrong. So now we show them a second example, three examples, four, five, six, seven. And there, after seeing only seven examples now, um, the model initialized with MAML is getting a few more of them right, but it's still not perfect, so we'll keep training it a bit more. And now, after seeing only 11 examples, the uh, meta-initialized model is doing perfectly on this language, whereas the randomly initialized model um, is still just spouting gibberish. And in fact, uh, the meta initialized model only needed 11 examples uh, to learn this specific language. Whereas if you kept training the randomly initialized model, it needs several thousand examples um, to reach this level of accuracy. So it's clear that meta learning has here given us some few shot learning capabilities. Um, but as I said earlier, rapid learning only gives you some indirect evidence for inductive biases. That is, it shows us for sure that we have some useful inductive biases, but we don't know if it's the specific ones we wanted to give the model. For example, maybe the biases the model has are just some uh, more general biases, such as biases for symbolic structure or something like that, without being the specific optimality theory um, constraints and ranking patterns that we wanted to be imparting to our model. So for a more direct evaluation, we will be for performing some targeted tests for each of six intended biases that we specify uh, in the paper, um, which raises the basic question of how can you tell what inductive biases a model has? And this is actually a very tricky problem. Um, the thing that seems obvious actually does not work. The th so this thing is just, just look at the model and look at the structure of the model and use that to say the model must have X inductive bias. So you still see people doing this sort of thing a lot. For example, saying something like, well, based on how RNNs are structured, um, we can tell that RNNs have a recency bias. And even though this seems intuitive, I don't think it's really a valid way to um, decide for sure that our models have that bias, because the basic fact is that we don't understand how neural networks work well enough for us to really be able to just look at an architecture and decide what biases it has. And I think um, the fact that this doesn't work is really illustrated very clearly by the way that MAML works, where um, th since the only thing that MAML changes is the initialization, it seems clear that uh, the model architecture alone is not enough to determine what the model's biases are. So to a human looking at our two models, the one that was randomly initialized and the one that was initialized by MAML, those two models look identical to a human, and yet they still have 
they still clearly have very different inductive biases. I mean, of course, if you're re really dedicated, maybe you are willing to look into these specific weight initializations of these two models and try to figure out what's different in the topology of that space. But I'm certainly not brave enough to do that. More power to you if you um, want to try doing that. So the thing that does work, in my opinion, is to analyze the model's learning behavior. Uh, the idea is that inductive biases are things that affect a model's learning behavior. So if you really want to tell what biases it has, you need to analyze its learning behavior. And we'll be looking at two basic approaches for doing this. The first is called the ease of learning approach, where the intuition here is that um, if a model has a bias favoring some property X over another property Y, then the model should find it easier to learn a language that has property X than a language that has property Y. And then the other type of approach is through uh, out of distribution generalization or in linguists terms, the poverty of the stimulus, where here what you do is you train the model on some ambiguous training set and then see how it generalizes. This is sort of like the example at the start of the presentation where there was the blue square and green triangle that is the training set was ambiguous between a generalization based on shape and a generalization based on color. Um, so here I'll be giving um, one example from each of these two approaches. Uh, in the paper, we have a few additional examples that I didn't want to include here just to keep the talk manageably long, but I do have bonus slides for the other ones if people are interested in the other um, analyses using these basic approaches. Uh, so first, using this ease of learning approach, um, this is to see if our models are biased toward the set of constraints I mentioned that we want them to be aware of, those four constraints of onset, no coda, um, et cetera. And so specifically here, I'm focusing on just these first two, where the framing that we've adopted uses the constraints of onset, which says that every syllable should start with a consonant, and no coda, which says that no syllable should end with a consonant. Um, but one could easily imagine two alternate constraints that a priori seem just as plausible and just as computationally easy, namely no onset, which says that every syllable should not start with a consonant, and coda, or sort of yes coda, which says that every syllable should end with a consonant. So here we're going to try to investigate whether our model has a bias for onset and no coda over these other incorrect constraints, no onset and coda. And the way we do this is we test whether it is easier for our model to learn languages defined with onset and no coda than it is for it to learn languages defined with no onset and coda, where we quantify ease of learning as the number of examples that are required to reach 95% accuracy. That is, we create training sets of different sizes, and for a given training set, we let the model iterate over that training set as many times as it needs to converge, and we see what is the smallest training set size that's needed under that paradigm for the model to reach 95% accuracy. And here are the results. Each bar in this plot is averaged over 100 different languages that embody the constraints shown under the bar. And you can see that um, for languages governed by onset and no coda, the two correct constraints, the model only needs around 200 examples um, to reach 95% accuracy. Whereas if we use the two incorrect constraints, the model needs more like 1,500 examples. And if we look at the bars in between, um, where there's one correct constraint and one incorrect constraint, then it needs an intermediate number of examples. Uh, so these results uh, support the conclusion that our model through meta learning has gained an inductive bias favoring these two correct constraints, onset and no coda, over the incorrect ones, uh, no onset and coda. Uh, excuse me, and was in your ranking no coda ahead of onset? Um, so this depends on which language you're um, um, you're dealing with. So within a given language, it could be either one. Mm -hmm. It's just you sort of, you know, so there are 24 possible languages. And when we sample, or sorry, 24 possible rankings. Um, and when we sample a language, we just randomly sample one of those 24 possible rankings. Got it, got it. When you, when you meta-train, um, how many uh, language examples are you using? Uh, the, the, the kind of ultimate question is, is it p possible or likely even that you've actually seen the very, all of the patterns ahead of time? Yes, great question. question. Yeah, so we're meta-training over um, something like 20,000 examples. So that is absolutely possible. And in fact, I said there were 24 possible rankings, but that's even exaggerating it a bit. There's really only eight distinct patterns. So there are 24 ways you can order these constraints. 
um, because it's four factorial, but it turns out that some of the 24 are equivalent to each other in terms of the outputs they predict. So really there are only eight unique input output mappings. We did try an experiment where during meta training, we only showed the model seven of the eight um, possible patterns. Um, and we found there that if you look at how easily it learns that eight with eighth withheld one, it definitely is harder for it to learn that eighth withheld case than it is to learn the seven that it saw, but it still has an easier time learning the withheld eighth case than it does learning you know, one of these other ones defined with other constraints. Um, so I think that makes it seem like the model's not just memorizing the eight specific cases independently. It does seem to be observing some commonalities between them, uh, albeit it's not doing it totally perfectly. Like ideally it would do just as well in this eighth case as it does on the seven it's seen. And that's not the case, but there still is some queer transfer between them. But, but yeah, great question. Okay. Um, then the other method I mentioned for investigating what inductive bias as a model has is by looking at its generalization, specifically its out of distribution generalization. And the specific example I'll be looking at here is that under the optimality theory account that we've adopted, the presence of certain mappings in a language implies the presence of certain other mappings. That's because this framework uh, restricts the hypothesis space of possible languages in a way, um, in a pretty specific way, that means that um, there are few enough possible languages that knowing one thing about the language can really tell you a lot about what else is going on in the language. So as an example of this, um, this framework requires that if a language maps an input of the form vowel consonant to an output that's just a vowel, then the language also has to map consonant vowel consonant to consonant vowel. Um, so, uh, and such implications are called implicational universals. So if our model truly has internalized um, the optimality theory framework that we want it to have, then it should be able to leverage what it has seen um, about one syllable structure to inform how it handles other syllable structures. So to see whether our model has a bias for such implications, what we do is we train the model um, for a specific language. We train it only on inputs that have one syllable structure to them. For example, the entire training set for this language would only have inputs of the form vowel consonant, um, where specifically we chose vowel consonant because this is the first half of this implication. Um, and then we test it on inputs of the withheld type, which form the other half of that implication. In, in this case, it would be inputs of the form consonant and vowel consonant. So here, um, if our model has internalized that implicational universal, it should be able to transfer from VC to CVC, whereas um, a model that has not internalized this information probably would not be able to do that because this is just a totally new type of input. It's not that reasonable to expect it to know how to handle it. And here's what we find. On the left, we have our model initialized with mammal. And on the right, we have a randomly initialized model where the pink uh, polka dotted bars show how the models perform on the in-distribution cases, the cases that are just like the ones they were trained on. And both of the models do pretty well on them. Um, but then the bluish bars show how the models generalize to the withheld type, the type that they were not trained on, but which the implicational universal should be able to inform them about. And here we see that uh, for the randomly initialized model, performance really plummets on that novel example type, whereas the mammal initialized one um, performs still very well. There is definitely a slight dip in performance, but it's still getting pretty good accuracy. Um, so it also seems like meta-learning has imparted some knowledge about these implicational universals, um, which enables these models to uh, have much better out of distribution generalization. Okay, um, yeah, and as I mentioned, we have a few more analyses along these same basic lines in the paper, or I do have bonus slides about them if you're interested in any specific thing. Um, so under the ease of learning category, we also look at some other kind of abstract properties that you have under optimality theory. For example, consistency of constraint ranking means that within a given language, you always have the same ranking of constraints. The ranking doesn't change from word to word. And you also have the same set of constraints um, so it's always those four constraints. It's not, it doesn't change arbitrarily inside the language. And then under the generalization, I showed you implicational universals and generalization relating to that. We also looked at generalization to greater lengths and generalization to novel symbols. That is, if the test set includes some letters that never appeared in the training set. Um, 
Uh, so to conclude, um, we found that meta-learning with MAML successfully imparted all of the inductive biases that we specified. And I honestly was just blown away by this. I should say the thing that got me started on this project was I was studying inductive biases and generalization, and my advisor told, told me about meta-learning as something that might be able to give inductive biases to models. And I thought it sounded outrageous and that it would never possibly work. So I thought I better just try it out to make sure that it doesn't work and then I can move along and forget about meta-learning. But then it just worked so well. So now I'm totally converted to the other side. Um, and so specifically, this shows that meta-learning uh, with MAML can improve both data efficiency and generalization to novel types of examples. Now, there are a lot of potential discussion points here. Um, so first, clearly the example I walked through here was um, very simple and artificial. So one of the most important questions is, does it scale up? Um, and we just haven't tried that out yet. Um, it's certainly clear that people can use meta-learning for realistic tasks, but our specific case depends on the construction of these um, synthetic languages that have the properties we want the languages to have. So it definitely is an important question whether that sort of approach can scale up. Um, yeah, I'm also happy to compare meta-learning as an approach to giving models inductive biases versus other approaches, such as designing a model architecture that has the biases you want or data augmentation. Um, and I'm also happy to talk about which biases can you impart in this way, because I think there are some types of biases that um, our method is much more amenable to than other, other biases. Um, and as I mentioned, there are a few more analyses that are in our paper, but not in the talk. Um, yeah, so I'm happy to, yeah, so I'll open it up to Q&A now. Like I said, happy to talk about any of these points or anything else that's not on here that you're uh, interested about. Thanks so much, Tom. It, it was a great talk, really interesting points. And as Tom said, we can open the floor to questions. Please feel free to ask questions. Oh, Katie has raised her hand. Katie, go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much for the talk. It was really good. I, um, I am curious what your thoughts are on like scaling this up, but not just in terms of, of data size, but in terms of like going from this relatively simple linguistic phenomenon to something more complicated, like trying to give a, a, you know, a translation model, some kind of syntactic biases or something like that. How would it scale to, to syntax or other kinds of linguistic phenomena? Absolutely. Yeah. So one question, so um, one thing that would be awesome if it's true is it might be possible to still take the general syntactic bias you have, uh, you want the model to have and instantiate it with these still very simple constructed languages. Um, and then the hope would be that this would give your model some inductive bias, which uh, I guess the hope would be that this bias can operate on a simple language or in a more complex language. Um, so for example, maybe you want to give it a bias for um, you know, handling long distance dependencies or something. I think it's possible that this actually could transfer from a simple language to a more complex one, but I think it's certainly not something you can take for granted. But I will mention that in that specific case, um, I have looked at data augmentation where we were looking at language modeling and we augmented the training data with some synthetically generated examples that illustrated long distance dependencies. And we did find in that case that even though these augmentation examples were synthetic, it still improved how the model handled long distance dependencies in natural language. So I think it's not totally hopeless for that sort of transfer to happen. Another approach that I think could be really interesting is, um, you know, so as I mentioned, this technique does require you to construct all these languages that you use for meta-learning. Um, and on the face of it, that seems like it necessarily has to be synthetic, but there might be clever things you could do where you can start with some natural language and kind of create a synthetic variation of the natural language. So for example, um, maybe you want your model to be able to handle all sorts of different word orders. Well, we might not have very many examples that exist of natural languages with all these different word orders, but maybe what you could do is take just English to start with and then um, take a tree bank in English and use some rules to sort of permute the word order of English based on that tree bank to kind of create a fake language that has that word order you care about. Um, so there has been some work where the first author was Sholi Ralfogel doing that sort of thing of creating synthetic variations in natural languages, which I think would be really cool to explore in this context. <laughs> 
Um, a last thing to mention since you brought up syntax is that syntax does have one major challenge, which was not present here in the phonology case. So in phonology, there's this sort of basic universal alphabet that applies to all languages, where all languages are pronounced with the same basic set of sounds. But in syntax, it's no longer really the case that we have this single universal alphabet, because sort of the basic units in the syntax are words. Um, and of course, every language has different words. So it might be that it's harder to meta train a model to have syntactic biases, because there's just this um, sort of, like there's no longer any shared universal substrate that um, you could build those biases over. But there are some tricks people have for getting around that. So actually one of the first papers that used meta-learning in NLP was um, Gu et al. Um, and I think Kian Hin Cho was the last author on that, which was looking at machine translation for low resource languages. And they had a certain way of initializing the vocabulary and embedding dictionary which um, I think was a clever way to address that problem. Thank you so much. Uh, Khalil has also raised his hand. Please feel free to go ahead. Thanks, a great talk. Um, so there is a very old sort of tradition of putting inductive bias without calling it that. So Markov himself uh, took the, the poetry of Pushkin and trained what we now call a Markov chain to learn uh, syllable structure in Russian. So he, uh, he learned things like uh, consonant, vowel. Uh, so he built the inductive bias into a model that had a consonant state and a vowel state and learned that if you're in a consonant, you're much more likely to go to a vowel than staying. So, there is that kind of long history which goes right into RNNs that do learn this kind of bias from. So what, I'm th uh, what I want to ask about is the kind of the power of your model versus the power of these much simpler models, or maybe they're not simpler, I don't know. They, they seem simpler because they're older. Uh, so have you thought about comparing your way of putting an inductive bias to very standard old ways of doing that? A great question. Um, yeah, so I think it's an interesting question because they both have their advantages. So I would say one of the major advantages of the older way is that you really know what your model is doing. So I mentioned that annoying thing where you cannot just look at a neural network and be sure what biases it has. Whereas if you have something like a markup chain, then you actually can just look at how the model is structured and be more confident what biases it has. So for that reason, I think these older types of models are still more popular among most cognitive scientists and linguists where they really want to understand what the model is doing. Um, yeah, and I think, I guess, more generally, you could view this more traditional approach as um, designing an architecture that has the biases you want, um, whereas the mammal-based approach is finding an initialization that has the biases you want. And I think that, um, in some sense, these two things might make certain types of biases easier or harder to impart. So the specific thing I'm thinking is that for designing an architecture, um, at least with neural networks, which is what I'm most used to thinking about, um, designing the architecture seems easiest for imparting kind of general abstract biases. So for example, if you wanna give a bias for recency, um, then you can do something like an RNN that proceeds sequentially, or if you want a bias for um, tree structure, then you use a tree RNN. And these things are very general abstract biases about the overall structure of the data you're working on. Um, whereas if you want, a bias about some more detailed concrete thing, like here a bias favoring no onset over onset. It's harder for me to see how you would bake that one into a standard neural network. Um, I think in the Markov case, that might be easier where there it's easier to see where the model is storing specific symbols, but in a neural network that's harder. Um, so I think meta learning might be easier for those kind of more specific concrete cases. And so I could actually see a potentially interesting project out of sort of combining the two approaches where you use architectural design to build in the more abstract biases you want to have, and then use meta learning to build in the more concrete things that would be harder to build in the um, architecture. Great, thank you. And great question. Thank you. Uh, John, do you want to go ahead next? Um, yeah, I was just thinking uh, if, we, if we use this, uh, the bias uh, learning um, approach to kind of consider the neural network model revolution, what we've learned over the past 10 or so years. Um, you know, initially, 
uh, so speak, speaking specifically about machine translation, for example, where, which I have, where I have more familiarity, um, the, uh, you know, when we first were using LSTMs to do translation, we saw that they were fine for uh, higher resource languages, but actually we needed to use um, the older architecture, which had a very strong assumption about what was happening, right? That there, there, were, there were translation assumptions there. So you could say that we had, you know, manually constructed uh, mm -hmm. uh, bias of the task baked in. Uh, and so uh, now, you know, once we've made the move to transformers, uh, it seems that the, we are able to do a lot better with lower resource data. So do you think this is amenable to the similar kind of analysis to, and, and or I guess, could you say that uh, you could test whether these biases have been learned um, through, th you know, uh, are, are or more learnable because of the architecture. So you can think of it as like meta learning in the architectural direction then, or I guess not, I mean, we've, we've hand done it. And then also like, how does that interact with the data oriented uh, approach to learning uh, the bias patterns? Right, you know, I really like that historical perspective on it. Um, yeah, let me think. So, um, or, so make sure I'm understanding. So you're asking like if transformers, um, have sort of um, the transformer architecture has learned or built in some of these biases that traditionally made the statistical so, approaches work. Or, or. Right. So, like, so for so in your example, right, when you, you when you do meta learning uh, first, then you you can use just a small amount of data to learn uh, your model very well, right? So clearly, you have learned something. Well, you've done analysis to then show that you've learned something that. Uh, uh, you know, encodes the, uh, the, the structural biases appropriately, right? So that's true for transformers too, right? right. Uh, for a randomly initialized transformer versus a randomly initialized LSTM uh, trained on a small amount of translation data, the transformer right. seems to do uh, well, uh, better generally. Uh, and so I just, uh, I guess the question was, um, well, sort of two part, which is, uh, uh, can we, can we, I guess in general, can we, can we, um, apply a similar kind of analysis that you've done on this to the choose the new model case. And then also, do you have any speculation on how these, if these things are better at learning these biases, how that kind of like uh, uh, interacts with uh, this meta learning approach. And maybe we could say, oh, actually it's already been trumped by it. Or maybe we can say, oh no, actually the meta learning uh, part on top of transformers does even better. Okay, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, so I think both of those things are quite or for your first question, I think it is very plausible that um, transformers works well because they have um, built in these sorts of important biases that we could otherwise add with meta learning. Um, and I mean, I guess it depends a bit on which biases you're talking about. So I think that, um, you know, if it's something like a bias for no onset or no coda, that pretty clearly wouldn't be in a transformer. Um, but more general things like being able to handle, um, you know, dependency structure or constituency structure. Um, I think it is plausible that transformers have a sort of graph built into them um, and nodes on the graph in a sense that make it easier for it to pick up on those things that traditionally needed to be built in. Um, yeah, then in terms of how that relates to um, our approach here, um, yeah, so uh, I think this is interesting also thinking about if you know that um, the bitter lesson thing from Rich Sutton where he was arguing that really the only thing that ever improves machine learning is just more compute time and more memory, etc. cetera. Um, so anytime you try to hand design something to build in a clever linguistic intuition, it never really seems to work. Um, uh, so. Definitely the approach we've outlined here is more along those lines of trying to build in some clever linguistic thing where here we've engineered the linguistic thing in the um, data set we've created. Um, so that might make it seem less likely to work in the long run. Um, but I would also say that I think, you know, if we view transformers in this way you framed it, they already kind of argue against that bitter lesson argument because it, it does seem like, you know, transformers are not just working because of more compute, um, they really are building in some useful inductive biases. And there even have been some nice charts showing that actually the big n-gram models that people were using before the neural revolution actually had far more parameters than um, 
at least some transformers and RNNs have. Um, so it's not just about compute. I think there is hope for sort of smarter ways of doing things. Um, and I guess a last thought I have on this is that um, the main use that I see our approach giving you is um, showing which inductive biases are helpful for learning language easily. So the basic way this would work is you use our approach to give some inductive biases to a model and then do that for a whole bunch of different possible biases and see which give you the best um, few shot learning capabilities. And once you've done that, what you now have is a bunch of biases that you know are useful. And then um, it's possible that the best way to give those biases to a model is through meta learning. But I actually sort of doubt that that's true because meta learning is pretty slow and inefficient. Um, so my hope, I guess, would be that once we know which biases we really need, that would then enable us to construct better architectures. Um, but we have no way of knowing for sure if that's the case. A uh, definite counterpoint to that, a counterpoint which would argue that really meta learning is the best we can do, is that people often draw this analogy between meta learning and evolution, um, where the idea is that meta learning is like evolution. It's given us the initial state that humans are born with. And then standard learning is like the learning you do over the course of your lifetime, where you take the weights that your brain starts with and then um, learn your actual language using it. And you could argue that maybe um, there is no really principled structure to that those initial weights our brain have. Maybe it's just some brain has, it's just some kind of random kludge of things that evolution has built up over time. So we'll never be able to capture that with any principled architecture. We'll need to just um, have some kind of uninterpretable initialization learned via mammal. I hope I answered your question. Were there other parts to it? I'm sure we can continue uh, later on, And but this is great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I also wanted to bring up something else because there is a discussion sort of going on on the side in the chat. Ooh. So uh, there is some discussion about uh, how different slash similar uh, do you think meta learning is uh, to like pre-training or uh, uh, like multilingual pre-training, uh, basically the comparison between meta learning and pre-training in your, right, in your opinion. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think they are definitely very similar and you probably could view pre-training as a form of meta learning. Um, I think the possible difference there could be is that, um, um, uh, okay, actually, I'm not even sure this is true, but the thing I was going to say is that you could have a case like in that visualization I had where the point you end up with with meta learning um, is sort of that point itself is not useful for anything. The only reason it's useful is that you can easily access other points. Um, but as I was saying that, I guess the same thing kind of applies to pre-training because with pre-training, you also have the fine tuning step. Um, so, you know, even if the point you end up with after pre-training is useless, fine tuning, you gives you the ability to reach a more useful point. Um, so yeah, actually I think it's a very tight relationship and I'm not sure I see a very principal distinction between them. Um, and there even was this um, really nice paper recently from UMass Amherst, I'm forgetting who the authors were, where they um, did a type of meta learning that really was just like language model pre-training, but where each task was they just picked a specific pair of words to distinguish between. So it was sort of like just a more targeted version of um, um, the standard language model pre-training. Um, and I think that it makes sense to call that meta learning for sure. And that did give some definite few shot learning improvements on downstream tasks. Well, uh, do you want to add anything on top of that? Sorry. Uh, okay, then, great. Uh, are there any other questions that I might have missed from chat or, or anything from the audience? Okay, great, thanks then. And um, thanks again, Tom, I really appreciate it. It was a very interesting talk and many interesting discussions came up afterward. And I think we, with that, we can give Tom a little break before the one-on-one -on -one meeting starts at 12.30. Well, thanks so much for coming, everyone. And yeah, these are really great questions. And